Welcome to a new episode of the Tolkien Experience Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown. I'm Luke Shelton. And I'm Sarah Westwick. Each episode, we share with you an interview of a Tolkien scholar or fan. That's right. In these interviews, one of us asks our guest to respond to six questions that help us learn about their personal Tolkien experience. All of this is made possible by our supporters on Patreon, so we want to thank them and encourage you to check out the community at patreon.com slash Tolkien experience. We are so excited to share this podcast with you. So without any more delay, let me introduce our guest. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Tolkien Experience podcast. And today I am immensely excited to reveal that our guest is none other than renowned Tolkien scholar, Verlin Flieger. And it almost seems redundant to make this introduction because I can't imagine that most of you haven't heard of Professor Flieger, but here goes. Verlin Flieger is a professor emerita in the Department of English at the University of Maryland at College Park, where she taught graduate and undergraduate st studies in Celtic, Arthurian, Native American and Norse myth. And she now teaches courses online for Signum University. Concentrating on modern fantasy with a special focus on the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, Professor Flieger's publications include, and this is not an exhaustive list, Green Sons and Fairy, Essays on J.R.R. Tolkien, Interrupted Music, Question of Time, J.R.R. Tolkien's Road to Fairy, which was, of course, the winner of the 1998 with the Paik Award for Inkling Studies, Splintered Light, Logos and Language in Tolkien's World, Tolkien's Legendarium, Essays on the History of Middle-Earth, which was co-edited with Carl Hostetter and which was the winner of the 2002 with the Paik Award for Inkling Studies. She's also written fictional works, which include Pigtail, the Inn at Corby's Core, Avilion, A Romance of Voices in the Doom of Camelot, Green Hill Country in Seeker of Dreams. And alongside that, of course, she is co-editor with Michael D.C. Drought and David Bratman of Tolkien Studies, that yearly journal devoted to scholarly examination of the words of J.R.R. Tolkien, and which is the go-to for so many of us who do any kind of scholarly work. She's a recognized public speaker and lecturer, She's appeared in several films and videos. She's participated in so many conferences. And she's also probably one of the best known scholars in Tolkien studies, whose presence at any Tolkien event engenders huge excitement and anticipation. So Verlin, welcome. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Sarah. I am delighted to be here. And thank you for your very nice introduction. You're most welcome, because I have to tell you, the Tolkien Experience podcast is immensely delighted that you've given of your time with us today, because um, although anybody who works in scholarly studies to do with Tolkien is almost certainly aware of your scholarly works, there'll be people who are fans of Tolkien who may have heard your name, but may not be quite aware of your own personal engagement with Tolkien. And that's what we would like to bring to our audience today, both the scholars and the non-scholar followers of Tolkien, something that's personal about your engagement with Tolkien. So that's what we would like to do. Then let's do it. <laughs> Great. Everybody's okay. engagement with Tolkien is personal. That's the only way for it to be. And that's why a podcast called The Tolkien Experience really sort of nails it, because that's what we all have, and that's what we all want to share. As C.S. Lewis said, what? You too? <laughs> there's, there's a gang of us, and, uh, and I get to talk about my Tolkien experience. What pleasure that is. And a pleasure for us to hear it as well. So let's start with that first question then. Um, and that is, when and how were you first introduced to Tolkien's work? I was first introduced in the winter of 1956-57, sort of somewhere in December, January, when I was working at the Folger Shakespeare Library in downtown Washington. And one of my co-workers, who was British, had been sent um, a three-volume novel with red covers by some professor that we'd never heard of, um, but we all read it and found it just marvelous. We passed it around. We talked about it. Uh, we 
loved every minute of it. And we thought it was really unlike anything we'd ever read, which it was, but it was also like so many things that we had read, like Arthur, uh, like Beowulf, like uh, all the medieval uh, stories about King Arthur and Robin Hood that we'd grown up with. Um, so that was my first experience with it. I didn't read it again because I had to give the book back to my <laughs> worker. Uh, and then I was happy to find it in a bookstore in an American edition, which I immediately bought and brought home and read to my then three children. <laughs> Some time had passed um, and they loved it too. And I kind of rediscovered it, um, especially reading it out loud. Um, that that was a special Tolkien experience because you realize that he does write for the voice. He is a poet. Uh, he likes the sounds of things. I was by that time back in graduate school working on an endless PhD. Um, and I was teaching as a graduate assistant some lower level courses. And I thought, you know, if I could get them to do it, how can I how can I teach Tolkien in English 101? And then I thought, no, you've got to you've got to package it. So I proposed a course in fantasy, of which the Lord of the Rings was to be the center. Uh, and since this was the seventies, they agreed to do it. And we started a course called Modern Fantasy. And it was so popular that they had to add on extra sections. Um, and I was sort of off and running after that. Then I asked if I could do my dissertation on Tolkien. And they said yes. Um, they didn't know what that meant. And some of the people on my committee didn't even read the book. But that didn't matter. I, after nine years, I got my PhD and started teaching Tolkien. So that's sort of the sum and substance. Wonderful. Uh, I would just want to pick up on something you were saying there, which I absolutely agree with. You're saying that uh, Tolkien loved the sound of things and that he was a poet. One of the things I've often come up against with people is this idea that when they're reading The Lord of the Rings, they skip over the poetry. They kind of miss it out. Yeah. What would you say to people to encourage them to read the poetry? I would just say, read the poetry. First of all, a lot of it looks at first like doggerel, like ho for the bath at the end of day. Um, but it's fun. It adds a little spice to the narrative. Um, and the words themselves do sort of sing. I mean, my kids loved Troll sat alone on his hill of stone. Dumb by, gun by, uh, peel it, steal it. Uh, and then you get to things like Bilbo's poem of Arundel, which you don't know anything about, but the words will carry you. He's trying a particular rhyme form there with feminine endings. Um, that kind of lilts so long. I think if you trust the poetry, you will find that it won't let you down. I think that's that's a really lovely way to put it, because I always find it's a shame when people say, oh, you know, I, I miss the poetry out because I just want to get on yeah. with the narrative. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I always feel like, oh, you, but you've missed something. You've really missed something that could give you a flavor of what's at the heart of Tolkien's work. Well, then when you get to, and, and it takes a while if you're reading it out, of, out loud, but when you get to the alliterative poetry, oh my God, um, it's just so wonderful. Um, the lament 
in, uh, it's after the battle, it's after the Pelennor Fields. Um, but that is just dynamite stuff. Uh, it gives me goosebumps. Mm. When and I it read. cries out to be read aloud as well, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. Mm. Okay, so <laughs> this almost sounds like a really odd thing to ask you because um, it's quite possible that, you know, you've obviously read everything that Tolkien wrote, that you can't pinpoint this, but do you have a favourite part of Tolkien's work? Is there a favourite moment or a favourite particular book or a favourite character or anything you can point to that you say, that's the one? <laughs> there are loads of them. <laughs> that's the many. Yeah. I notice that volume one is more worn than the other two. Hmm. Uh, and that just says to me, you go to it more often, uh, which I do, but also for reference as well as for pleasure. I can remember when I first read The Lord of the Rings back in 1957, uh, getting to one particular passage and just literally having my breath taken away and that was the scene with Faramir in Ithilien um, when Frodo and Sam have been some quasi captured and taken in. And Frodo looks at the window, the window on the west. Mm -hmm. I think that's the name of the chapter. And he sees the sunset through the waterfall. And Tolkien's description of that was just so magnificent and so beautiful that I, I literally lost my breath. I thought, wow, you know, what? It just, it was a moment that I've never forgotten. Mm -hmm. And still when I read it, oh, it gives me that kind of thrill. But then the one that that I can never read without starting to cry is just as, as valuable, just as precious. And it is the conversation between Frodo and Sam um, when Frodo tells Sam that he has to go away. And it's, I can't get through it. <laughs> I, I used to, when I would teach it at the university, I would have to ask a student to please read it for me. Um, and they would all laugh and, you know, sort of settle back and say, well, that's the way she is. <laughs> um, but it's just so moving. Yeah. And so true. Mm. And so sad because it's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Because we did save the site of the Shire Sam, but not for me. Oh, don't, Sarah, oh. don't get me started. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I gear up. Yeah, exactly. It is so affecting. Um, for me, it's that is, is definitely a point, but the death of Theoden does for me every single time as well. I find that oh, so... Oh, that's lovely, yes. Oh, yeah. The language and just that moment and, oh, yeah. that You you just sort of get this lump in your throat and you're trying to read past that. It's amazing. Well, but it's, don't you think it's also also because it's Theoden? Yeah. And he's such a lovely guy. <laughs> uh, and and you, you love him. Or at least I do, and I bet you do, too. Yes. Uh-huh. So, and that's part of Tolkien's genius. It isn't just the writing. It's not, well, of course, it's the words on the page because that's all we have. But, but it's, it's not just their sound. Uh, it's not just their meaning. It's what he has built into it from, from behind. Yes. It's know these people. I, you know, it's that it's Frodo who says to Sam, I thought so too. Mm -hmm. It's Theoden who's dying. 
Yeah. And we care. And we care. Mm -hmm. You've said it. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a kind of magic in writing like that, I think, where you've been pulled so thoroughly into that world that you feel like it's the death of someone you actually know somehow. It's extraordinary. And um, conversely, and for the same reasons only turned around, I do not weep at the death of Denethor. Yeah. Because I know him too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've got shivers up my spine now. (laughs) It's uh, yeah. There's no other writer who gives me that sensation no. where you feel so thoroughly immersed yeah. that um, each character you feel like you know them, as you said, you know them, you understand them, you you almost are standing next to them um, when they're going through things and what they go through. You see that and you feel it. I think you've said it. Mm quite extraordinary and that's of course why we're all here you know thinking about Tolkien and talking about Tolkien and um, our experiences of Tolkien because it means something and I, I honestly think that we'll be still talking about him long after I'm gone because it will still speak to people that's I think the important well, thing yes absolutely and that puts paid to all the people who dismissed him, and who mm. sometimes some of them still dismiss him, although not nearly as many. Huh. But he's going to be around when we're all gone and they're all gone. Yeah. Yes, I think so. So piffed to all of those people, I say, <laughs> with a side order of piffle. Piffle, right. <laughs> Okay, so um, we've managed to talk about favourite moments in Tolkien's work and um, our mutual, I think, love for his language and his characterization and what he brings to the story. So this is a slightly different question, really. What is your fondest experience connected to Tolkien's work? So that could be a moment of engaging with it, or it could be something that you researched about it that was like an aha moment or, you know, a particular conference or, you know, any kind of engagement and experience that you had with Tolkien's work that really sticks in your mind. How much time have you got? As much as you like, Verlin. We're <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, that All the conferences have just been wonderful because... You meet other people who've who've got a slightly different take. You learn things. Oh, let me see. Okay. Um, I'll just start with the most recent, if that's okay. Sure. The most recent. Uh, I've been doing some work with Arendelle mm-hmm. lately, and I've been making what I think are some really interesting discoveries about what Tolkien thought he was doing. Now, this is getting into Tolkien's head, and that's tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. With Arundel, that I found absolutely fascinating. Uh, I've had a sort of, my gosh, was he really? Yes, he really was. That sort of moment. Um about Arundel um, that is that is the most vital right now. Now, shall I go on and tell you what it is or <laughs> or not? Oh no, please don't leave us hanging on the edge of our seats. That would just be okay. cruel. Well, um, you know the tale of Arundel is the one that never got told. And I'm thinking more and more and more and I'm writing a paper about this that he never meant it to be told, that it was a kind of teaser, that he wanted to string people along um, and say, well, there's Baron and Luthien, and there's uh, uh, the children of Horin, and uh, 
Gondolin and all of those. Uh, but how about this one? How much would you like to know about it? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's it's that process of of pulling back, of withholding, that I think is one of the one of the greatest tricks in his book, uh, and it's one that every actor knows. You don't give it all. You let the audience beg for it. And I think that's what Tolkien is doing with uh, with the tale of Arendelle, because it never gets told. Um, he says, okay, and now we come to, ta-da! And somebody always interrupts and says, no, not now. We'll do that later. Uh, so it it's this kind of thread of, of pro provocation, of tease that runs through, not the Lord of the Rings, but the whole of the, the Silmarillion. And I think it was very clever of him to have thought of that and to have brought it off. So hold on, you're telling us that that Arendell thing was one giant Tolkien tease. Yes. Huh. <laughs> well. Well, and of course, I expect some pushback uh, because I think a lot of people are going to say, oh, come on. Uh, are you really saying, what about this and this and this and this? Um, and I would love to hear it. I'm, I'm ready for you. Do you know what I'm really enjoying right this second as well? What? Before we went on air, before we started recording, you told me that you were retired. And I said, ha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're not. No, no, you're not. <laughs> you got me. Because <laughs> you're still excited about discoveries with Tolkien, aren't you? Of course. I think everybody is. That's the Tolkien experience. <laughs> that's what we're doing. And that's what keeps it going on and on and on. Absolutely marvellous. So, you've clearly been engaging with Tolkien for quite some time. I'm going to be extremely polite and not actually add up all of those years. Um, but you've been, you've been working um, in a scholarly fashion with Tolkien now for some time. Do you think the way in which you've approached his work has changed over time at all? Yes and no. When I did my dissertation, I was trying to please my committee. Yes. So I tried to point out that this is not um, some Winnie the Pooh fantasy, uh, that this has good, solid medieval roots, and that it belongs in the same category with, and then you can name uh, all of the others, Beowulf, Thomas Mallory, um, Edmund Spencer, uh, it was kind of a defense of Tolkien. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to do that anymore because that case has been made and made marvelously, first by Tom Shippey, uh, but then by lots and lots of other people with great academic credentials. So now I'm much more interested in Tolkien as a modernist, mm -hmm. uh, as somebody very au courant with, um, with modern literary theories and ideas. Um, he's metafictional in a way that I think is very clever of him because nobody notices it, but it's there. Um, and I've gotten much more interested in the Silmarillion. Uh, I still think that the jewel in the crown is the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But it is that 
for the most part, because it's got the Silmarillion behind it uh, and, and backing it and, and giving it solidity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been working with um, the three great tales. I gave a paper um, a couple of weeks ago to an Italian Tolkien Association on the three great tales and what What's really going on with them? How did they interface with each other? Uh, why were they great? Uh, what in Tolkien's mind made them the great tales? And none of that comes into the Lord of the Rings except when Elrond says to Frodo at, um, at Rivendell, if all of the elf friends and all of the heroes, and then he names them, um, were gathered, you would be in their company. And that's the background. And of course, when I first read that, and for years afterward, even when I read it to my children, I didn't know who they were. Turin and Horin and, uh, and Aaron. <laughs> they were just names. Um, but they weren't names to Tolkien. He knew exactly who they were. Mm -hmm. One whose story he wouldn't tell anybody. Um, and I've gotten much more interested in, in the solidity of that, in the, the fact that that's the presence, that's the unseen but not unfelt presence that's behind what is still to me the major work. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. What do you think? What's yours, Sarah? Uh, the, what's my approach to Tolkien? Yeah. Um, like you, I had to satisfy a PhD committee. Uh, and uh, like you, I found myself, this is only back in 2013, having to justify my study of Tolkien uh, and what made him still relevant, um, which... Like you, I, I now feel I'm done with that. I don't have to do that. Yeah. Uh, my study of Tolkien has always been Tolkien as a modernist, in fact. And um, most of my work is about how he was writing in response to the anxieties of the 21st century. All of those things that were changing, changing, changing around him. And so he's a man standing in the middle of that, both looking backwards and looking forwards and trying to make sense of all of it. Um, and so that's where my work has been. Um, so I I've kind of... In the middle of it, that's great. Have so, you published? Are you publishing? Um, <laughs> this is embarrassing. Very little of my work is published actually because of reasons. Um, uh, you've heard, I'm sure, of imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, there's that. I am actually, I've had a chapter accepted for uh, a work that will be hopefully coming out at the start of next year, which is an anthology of work, um, which is reading Tolkien through queer theory. Mm. So um, I've had a paper about Shelob that has been accepted for that. So that'll be interesting Great. to see. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to be published on that. Um, other than that, I suppose it's it's like a. I would like to one day. I did a course at Signum. I did one of the twelve week courses at Signum. Um, so that was twenty four lectures on Tolkien as a modernist. So I did that, uh, and I've I've had a few papers here and there, but not a not a great deal. Well, get going. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. You've got um, a lot to say. Yeah, um, hopefully publishing my paper of, that I gave to the Tolkien Society, which was about, that was my argument that the ring of power isn't actually gold. Wow, really? Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, an alchemical reading alongside a reading of Tolkien's language. Because uh, Tolkien uh, uses a lot of equivocation around his description of the ring. Um, oh, seems. Seems like, and, and it's like gold. It seems like gold. Um, yeah. Golden. 
Uh huh. But it's never actually it's never actually called gold. It's once it's named as of gold, but you've still got that step back. Yeah. With that word in there, um, and so and if you take that's exciting. But say some more. <laughs> this or, is or maybe to do with you. It's an alchemical reading in the end that also uh, looks specifically at Tolkien's love for um, simile rather than metaphor. He uses a great deal of simile in his um, figurative language. Um, yes. And around the ring, it is always simile. And then the alchemical reading, because anything that's gold must be de facto pure. And yes. the ring of power cannot be pure. I think you're onto something. That's that's really very exciting, and it makes me it makes me think. Um, and this is kind of an odd tangent, but put up with me. It makes me think of my daughter-in-law, who never read the book, but my son did and told her all about it. Um, and when she saw the movie, she said, "That's the ring." I could get something better at Target. <laughs> and I thought, yes, lady, you are on to something. Because you can't, it's just a ring. Yeah. Uh, but it's the words, it's exactly what you're saying, Sarah. It's the way Tolkien surrounds it with things. And he, a lot of the time, and I bet you're going to say this, he makes you look at it through somebody else's eyes. Yes. To yeah. whom it seems. Hmm. Yeah. And it promises everything and delivers nothing. A bit like a ring from Target, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that will be my next work. <laughs> the ring from Target. The ring from Target. You bet. I look forward to that. <laughs> okay, so let's get away from me. I want to talk more about you. Um, so this question is about the way in which you would talk to others about Tolkien. How would you, if you came across somebody who'd never read Tolkien, possibly hadn't even seen the films, how would you persuade them to read Tolkien's work? What would make you recommend it? How would you recommend it to somebody to read? I never recommend it to anyone. Now that's an answer we've never had. <laughs> <laughs> I might say, here, read this, but I never say you'll like it, hate it, find it interesting, um, because I let Tolkien do that. Um, if you open that book, if you read the first page uh, with all its playfulness and all its sort of wry humor, um, you either get with it uh, or it goes right over your head. Mm -hmm. uh, and for people whose heads it goes right over, uh, you're never going to convince them. I mean, you know, Germaine Greer is never going to read The Lord of the Rings. No. Because she thinks it's about teddy bears. Um, Whatever. <laughs> but But I will give it to people and say, here, I, I don't know whether that's a good answer or not. No, I think that's an excellent answer, actually. It's very different to other answers that we've had, but I like that, uh, you know, I like that approach, the idea of here you go, see what you think, rather than yeah. here's what I think, that's why you must read it. So Yeah, yeah which is, I think, what, what you're really saying when you when you fulsomely recommend a book, you're saying, here's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Which then puts pressure on that reader to, well, you know, this is what I think. Why wouldn't you think the same? And if you don't, then why don't you think the same? And it, I think that you've already created there some kind of 
uh, problem that needn't be there. Some kind of friction. I agree. Mm -hmm. Or they're doing it to please you. Yeah. I yeah. Think you've put the words in my mouth. <laughs> I think you've the them. words first. <laughs> That's like my husband. My husband will never read The Lord of the Rings. He's never going to read The Lord of the Rings. He's never read anything like that. It just is not something that he wants to read. There'd be no point in me saying, but it's wonderful. He knows I think it's wonderful. That's not going to make him read it. No, um, but that's fine. He doesn't wear your clothes. He doesn't. Uh... Not usually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can. And what you're saying is, it is possible to like or even love somebody if they don't like the Lord of the Rings. It is. Yes. Yeah. And it, it, in, it's defining, but not discriminating. Now, those are good words. Yes. Yeah, I agree. So to kind of draw this uh, interview towards its close, what are you excited for? in the future of Tolkien studies? What's an area that you think, oh, I hope somebody gets to do that, or I'd be really interested in hearing more about this? Gosh. Yes, I know that's a huge question to throw at someone with no it, preparation. It, it is an enormous one. Uh, I'm just sort of running down my list. This is mm -hmm. this. I think I'm gonna have to say, I want to be surprised. Hmm. I want somebody to get something out of this book and tell me about it that I haven't seen. Yeah, yeah. And for a scholar that's been, you know, working for some time on Tolkien, you really have seen quite a lot of the major arguments around Tolkien already. I've seen a lot, but I don't think it's by any means the lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember you saying to me at one conference that um, you were surprised at the dearth of work on the Notion Club papers. Do you think that's still the case? I haven't read very much on it. Mm. Um, yeah, I would. I'd love to see somebody really tear into the Notion Club because I think he's He's dipping into some seldom visited aspects of his secondary world, mm -hmm. like reincarnation, which he very carefully says, no, no, this is not reincarnation. It's just different people inhabiting the same bodies. <laughs> um, but it is. And he knew it was, and he was interested himself in reincarnation. So yeah, I'd love to see somebody really getting into that. Do you have any ideas about it, Sarah? Me, myself, personally? No, I really don't, because I'm ashamed to say that although I have read the Notion Club papers, I haven't spent any real time on pulling it apart. Um, and I suppose the problem is we say we, that's a little all-encompassing. I certainly feel more directed towards uh, his published narratives, you know, the great work, as you call it, The Lord yeah. of the Rings, The Hobbit, Silmarillion, all of those. Um, and I just, I haven't engaged as much with things like the Notion Club papers. And that is a bit of a shame, but I wonder if that's actually prevalent amongst scholarship is that we feel pulled towards these. And that one just gets left in the dust a little bit. It does. Um... And especially, how can I say this? Uh, it's in two parts. Mm -hmm. And the first part uh, is really a rehash of an Inklings meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did, in fact, at one point, assign identities <laughs> uh, to, to the characters. And even if he hadn't, you can pick out Hugo Dyson, you can pick out Owen Barfield. Um, but in the second part, where the two time travelers um, set off time traveling, uh, he's going into what for him was, as far as I know, kind of uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. 
although I suspect he was, this is going to be risky, I, I suspect he was writing from experience. I suspect he had had moments like that, that he could draw on. So that at the end of part two of, um, of the Notion Club papers, uh, which is all about time travel, uh, one of the characters says, well, back up a little bit, in the middle of part two, one of the characters says, well, I'll tell you about this dream that I had. Uh, and then he launches into it in first person without so much as a buy you or leave. I awoke on the bench and the others were gathered around listening to the shop. And you are pulled into the dream without any transition at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you just are back there. And this is the story of Sheaf, the baby in the boat at the beginning of Beowulf, who arrives as shield chafing um, and comes to to become a good king, Fatwas good Kunig. Um, and it goes on and on and on in this wonderful recreation of that world in in first person narrative, so that you're absolutely there with it, and then it gets to a moment, and there I think I shall stop says the modern day man, and you are just jolted mm -hmm. out of your trance and out of his dream into the modern world. And then you realize that that's the end of the Notion Club papers. Mm -hmm. So you've gone two removes back from this immediate Fairian drama, and that's a loaded term, as Tolkien talks a lot about it in the essay on fairy stories, and he never says what it is. Um, but I think that it's that kind of thing. I want somebody to, to do that. I want somebody to jump in and take a look at, at what's going on there and then say, what needs to be said about why Tolkien was writing about it. <sighs> that's a long preamble to a tale. Uh, well, I think yeah. that's set a challenge for people. There we go, everybody. The challenge has been set by Verlin Flieger. Okay. Go read the Notion Club papers and see what you can do with it. That's no bad challenge, I think. I think, yeah, that was very interesting. It up. Mm -hmm. So, I don't get the sense from you that you are worried about the future of Tolkien studies. No, <laughs> not in the least. I think we've just started. I think we've just managed to clear away the debris and see the road ahead of us or the roads ahead of us. I think it's, I wish I could live to be 100. Well, I plan to be 100. I wish I could live to be 200. Uh, so I could see what the future of Tolkien studies really turns out to be. Mm. Well, I promise to come and attend your paper that you give on your 100th birthday, Verlin. So that's a date. The only one. I welcome your presence. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't want to hear any more of this I'm retired nonsense. <laughs> okay. Enough said. But, but um, it's, it's a, a continuing joy, actually, to hear you, to listen to your papers and to read what you put out because your love for Tolkien just, it shines through when you're speaking about him, when you're writing about him, it comes off the page. It's one of the glories of actually reading what you write, Berlin, to be honest. Um, you just sense your enthusiasm. It's right there. Thank you, Sarah. That's as much as anybody could possibly ask for. Uh, I'll settle for that. 
Well, I think that's a, a lovely place to leave the interview, actually. Um, it's been oh, wonderful. We can't talk for another two or three or four hours. <laughs> you and I certainly can. We can go and fetch our beverages of choice and, uh, and okay. kick back and chat. Okay. Well, thank you, Sarah, for some really interesting questions. Some posers, some that really kind of shook me out of my complacency. Made me think. You're a good. You're a good questioner. <laughs> you have no idea how much I am blushing at this moment. <laughs> it, it really has been lovely, and um, I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed it. If they've enjoyed it half as much as I have, then it will have been a splendid experience for them to listen to your Tolkien experience, Berlin. So thank you very much again for giving of your time. Thank you. We are so thankful that we have such gracious scholars and fans who want to share the Tolkien experience with us and with you. We really enjoy making these podcasts and the fun doesn't stop here. That's right. It continues on social media. You can find us on Facebook as Tolkien Experience and Twitter as at Tolkien EXP. Don't forget to like, follow, share and comment because we love interacting with you just as much as we enjoy talking to our guests. For even more content, and to join our fellowship of supporters, check out our Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Tolkien Experience. Finally, you can also follow our personal Twitter accounts. I'm at Luke B. Shelton. I'm at SR Westwick. And I'm at Aaron L. Palmerdale. If you have questions or comments, you can send them to us by email at tolkienexperience at gmail.com. If you want to know more about this week's guest, we provide show notes at TolkienExperience.com. You can find the podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple, Stitcher, and YouTube. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and we truly hope that, in a way, it contributes to your own Tolkien experience.